Welcome to the show, Susan. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. So uh, this book is the story of Rin Tin Tin and the pretty fascinating people uh, who've kept his legacy and his offspring alive through his 90-year career. What do you think it was about this dog that just totally captured people's imaginations? Well, Rin Tin Tin first came into the public eye not in the 1950s, which is where many of us might think of him as having first become a star. He actually became a star in the 1920s in the silent film era. He was um, a puppy who had been found in World War I, brought back to the U.S. by this man, Lee Duncan, who found him on a battlefield there, and he became a star at a time, number one, silent film, where dogs could be as emotive and exciting and dramatic as a, as a human. And he became a big star, not as a sidekick, but as a leading man. And also, this was at the end of a horrible period of time, World War I, which was utterly devastating. And I think that this image of a heroic dog who could kind of solve everything, who struggled through... He was always shown as struggling, and then finally because he was loyal and strong and righteous, he would come out and solve the problems that had been presented to him. So I think he had this heroic quality, but he wasn't a person, which made it almost more possible to fall in love with him and be inspired by him. Well, and he had this incredibly expressive face, and and Lee had taught him these extraordinary tricks. I mean, he really acted. His face changed, and... Yeah, if you see those films, the silent films, he he was paid five to eight times as much as the human actors in the film. When you see the films, you know why. And he was a pretty extraordinary talent in that way. Didn't he actually win the, an Oscar, but they changed the voting because they wanted a human to win it? Yeah, this is one of the darker episodes in American history. <laughs> It was the very first year the Oscars were being given out. According to my reporting, he received more, the most votes for Best Actor. And the Academy, being a new organization with this new kooky idea of giving out these Oscars, thought maybe it wouldn't look that good if we give the first Best Actor award to a dog. I think they might have So been they wise. rewrote the rules saying that the awards had to go to a human. <laughs> um, I didn't realize this, but back in the silent era, there were a lot of dogs. And in fact, um, there's a wonderful uh, piece that you wrote in the book that I was wondering if you could just read. Um, sure. About dogs and film at that, t- at that yeah, time. Yeah, I, mean, I will preface this. At the time Rin Tin Tin became a big star in the 20s, there were 80, 80, 80 other German shepherds starring in films. Um, here we are almost 100 years later. He's the only one that we remember. Although my next book, of course, will be about Zandra, the dog. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. All right, here we go. Uh, Dogs, in fact, were perfect heroes, unknowable but accessible, driven but egoless, strong but tragic, limited by their muteness and animal vulnerability. Humans played heroes in film, too, but they were more complicated to admire because they were so particular, too much like us or too much unlike us or too much like someone we knew. Dogs, on the other hand, have the talent of seeming to understand and care about humans in spite of not being human, and perhaps are better at it because of that difference. They are compassionate without being competitive, and there is nothing in their valor that threatens us, no demand for reciprocity. As Lee knew very well, a dog can make you feel complete without ever expecting much in return." Yeah, Thanks. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Livewire. We're talking to Susan Orlean about her book, Rin Tin Tin, The Life and the Legend. And 
it, it's interesting to me. It seems like so much of the reason that they would have used the dogs as well was just that it wasn't any specific gender necessarily, noticeably, or or race of person, that it was just completely universal. Well, what's funny is that Rin Tin Tin was the puppy of a German war dog found in France, and he became the ultimate American icon. People really responded to it as a universal, the way a, a person could never be quite so universal, because they're either they're American, or they're tall, or they're... Uh, you know, they they have such specific connections, or they look like your uncle, you know, Joe. You exactly, know, you can't stand that guy. <laughs> right, yeah. right. And with dogs, you don't bring any of that to it. Yeah, I, I wanted to talk about the the papers. You spent so much time with Lee Duncan's papers, with Burt Leonard's papers, who was one of the producers of Rin Tin Tin, the television show. And at one point, you said. I have. I had never realized how crackling and alive someone's papers could be. Can you explain that? I have done all of my writing um, up until now, mostly in the here and now. Spend time with real people and going out and having experiences and talking with them. When I started this book, I suddenly thought, what am I doing? First of all, it's about a dog. Secondly, everybody in it everybody important in the story is dead. So there was a, I had a couple of dark nights of the soul (laughs) where I thought, oh my, what am I doing? Because I'd never done a lot of historical research. And I just thought, well, if I'm going to read someone's papers, it's going to be so boring. Instead, it was, it was amazing. It was much more intimate than an interview would have ever been. I mean, When someone dies, if they're a person of some import, all of their papers are gathered up, and they're not really censored. So you see a lot of material that you would never be exposed to or hear about if you had talked to someone. And Lee, in particular, was very reserved. He he was somebody who wasn't going to reveal a lot about himself. He had been put in an orphanage when he was a young kid because his mother simply couldn't take care of him. So I found the papers where she wrote in, in, at, at the point she was leaving Lee at the orphanage that her husband had deserted her. She had no idea if he was alive or dead. Lee maintained always that his father had died of uh, appendicitis. So that was an example of something. First of all, it was incredibly emotional to read this note, this young woman leaving her kids at an orphanage but also knowing I would have never heard that from him directly. And it was, this, it was a kind of marvelous realization that we exist in all of these, um, the, the ephemera, the flotsam and jetsam that we leave behind is actually full of life. It also made me think, and now what? Since exactly. Since nothing is on paper anymore. I mean, would I sit there going through someone's hard drive I and go... I think that's go, what's going to happen. Whoa, now I really feel like I know him. Right. And I actually do wonder about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, before you go, I just wanted to ask you, you write these books about these people who are so passionate about these things. Is there anything that you're that passionate about? Well, this is always the great question. And it was certainly the... Um, essential question in The Orchid Thief, because I had spent all this time following a, a very loopy guy, um, John LaRoche, for a couple of years. And so much of the time, I would just look at him and think, you are so weird. You're so, you, you know, you, orchids, orchids, this is what you, this is your life. You're, and, you know, I couldn't figure out how could he shape his whole life around this crazy passion, in particular, this passion for getting this one rare orchid. And there was a day where I went with him hiking into the Fakahatchee, which is a swamp in South Florida. And believe me, I never had that as part of my job description, swamp hiking. Mm -hmm. But it, it came about. And I hate swamps. I mean, who wouldn't? And I was... Following him, we're going further and further into the swamp, and the water's up at my waist, and, you know, I'm feeling around for alligators and snakes, and it's just, like, the worst situation. And 
And I'm looking at him and thinking, what kind of idiot would go hiking through swamp looking for orchids? Oh. <laughs> Right. And there was a kind of a very sad moment for me where I thought, okay, let me think. There are two of us here. <laughs> uh, one of them is that Id idiot, and the other is this idiot. And it made me realize, even though I've always looked at these obsessives as these odd alien beings who are so committed, and I can't understand it because I'm so kind of chill, and I don't... Right. I don't get really caught up in stuff, but obviously I had been missing the nose of my face, essentially, which is I love stories. I love, I love learning stories. I love telling stories. I love the idea that I've told stories and someone has experienced that story and come away feeling maybe changed or or that the world opened up a little bit for them. And so I am that idiot hiking through the swamp. I mean, it was that sort of moment of revelation that I am really passionate about, about this idea of story and, and learning and telling them. Well, this is a beautiful story. Uh, the book is Rin Tin Tin, The Life and the Legend. The author is Susan Orlean. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. It's been great My pleasure. You. You've been listening to a snippet of Livewire, the radio variety show that's like a chew toy for your brain. For more information about the show or to download our podcast, visit livewireradio.org.